Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. We have so many time zones represented in this room today. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody to our day three of the Taos Institute gathering, unfolding dialogues, relational resources for global good. And this is a week long series of virtual global events. I hope that all of you have already been participating and in the platform um, and really exploring what we're offering this week. So my name is Dawn Dole and I'm the executive director for the Taos Institute. And I'm going to try to speak slowly for our simultaneous translators. And for those of you who are new to the Taos Institute, the Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to developing, sharing, and expanding social constructionist theory and practice by focusing on relational, collaborative, appreciative, and dialogic practices. We bring together scholars, practitioners, students, and the ever curious for vari from various disciplines like organization change, leadership, education, therapy, healthcare, research, and much more. We have Publication Wing with more than 40 printed books and over 90 free downloadable books in 12 languages. We offer workshops and conferences, a diploma program, and dialogue with the authors. We like to think there's something here for everyone. And this week that you've joined in with the 2022 gathering, we have over 60 events happening during the week in a variety of languages, in various time zones and hosted by people from around the globe. And it's exciting to know that we have people joining us this week from 35 different countries on just about every continent. We have Canada, Morocco, Puerto Rico, the US, Italy, the Netherlands, Brazil, Lithuania, India, South Africa, Argentina, Rwanda, Bermuda, Chile, Norway, Sweden, Japan, Taiwan, Mexico, Bangladesh, Ireland, France, Singapore, Belgium, Bolivia, Australia, Switzerland, Cuba, Czech Republic, Germany, Spain, UK, Ghana, Guatemala, and Greece. And if I missed your country, please put it in the chat and make sure that I don't miss it the next time. So we're all here to learn, explore, and share and co-create practices from the local to the global that focus on how social constructionist ideas and practices can help us create and bring forward new ways of going on together in this world we live in that's facing global challenges in ever increasingly volatile and complex ways. And we need these innovative ideas and practices of promise for our ways of relating and going on together now more than ever. And now I wanna introduce our daily global connection plenary titled Relational Governance. Our hosts for this session are Ken Gergen and Monica Sesma, and our guests are Hilary Cottam from the UK and Otar Ness from Norway. They will be sharing with us about today's conditions of rapid and chaotic change, traditional governments, and how we can enter into practices that support the well being of citizens in collaboration with their governments. So I'm gonna introduce each of them and then they're gonna take over. So Ken Gergen is co-founder and president of the Taos Institute. He is senior research professor at Swarthmore College. 
He is a major figure in the development of social constructionist theory and its application to practice of social change. He also lectures widely on contemporary issues in cultural life, including the self, technology, postmodernism, civil society, organization change, developments in psychotherapy, educational practices, aging, and political conflict. Gergen has published over 300 articles in journals, magazines, and books. And his major books include Toward Transformation in Social Knowledge, the Saturated Self, Realities and Relationships, and an Invitation to Social Construction. Monica Sesma is from Canada, and she is also um, on the board of directors for the Taos Institute. She is a social constructionist oriented family therapist, an educator, a supervisor, and a researcher. She is an assistant professor and the academic coordinator of the couple and family therapy program at the facility or the faculty of social work university of calgary she works at the east side community mental health services and the calgary family therapy center as a family therapist researcher and supervisor she is the research coordinator mm -hmm. of the calgary family therapy center mm -hmm. her current interests include focusing on children and families, immigrants, refugees, and newcomers' systemic issues. Hillary, uh, Hillary Cottom is an internationally acclaimed author, innovator, and change maker. She combines new thinking with radical and concrete practice. Hillary lives in London. She holds a PhD in social sciences and is an honorary professor at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL. Hillary is named UK Designer of the Year in 2005 for her pioneering approach to social design. And in the same year was recognized by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader for her work in the field of social change. In 2019, Hillary was honored with the OBE for services to the welfare state. She is a trustee of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and her latest book is Radical Help. Otarnes is from Norway, and he was telling me today that he's only got about four hours of daylight right now in the winter time. Uh, Otar works as a professor of counseling at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and serves as the head of the Nordic Research Center for Wellbeing and Social Sustainability. He is interested in co-creation and relational welfare as approaches to support well-being for all as a public value and mission for societal development by focusing on democratic innovation, relational governance, and transformation of economic systems, such as well-being economy. He, is, he also has an interest in recovery processes in mental health, family, and relational therapies. He uses mixed methodologies and participatory and action research methods and people-powered research-based social change for common good. So welcome to the four of you. As you enter into dialogue, I'm gonna turn it over to the four of you now. Okay. I guess I'll begin, um, first of all, by just thanking you, Hillary and Otar, for being here. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen you face to face. Uh, I guess our future, however, is going to be probably in cyberspace for the good of the planet. But unfortunately, but you're smiling and I feel your presence, and that's great. Um, also, we are all really honored that you would be here. I mean, your work um, in governance is just um, amazing and really uh, leading in terms of, of the global future. Uh, let me say a little bit about the way we've tried to understand this in terms of 
the government institutions that we have are ancient and in some ways unwieldy. And one might say they're increasingly dysfunctional. I mean, here we have a world of rapid change with needs of various sorts, so issues of many, many kinds moving through society, and yet governance is there as a structure with internal squabbles, differences, uh, with outside influences, unable to respond to that, the needs of people, to the voices of the people. So increasingly, you get the sense within within societies of governments that are that are not working for us, for us, with that emphasis on you, the government should be serving us, the people. That is that split, that sort of sense of you there, uh, we, you should be working for us and doing things for us. And we sit here and we, we just sort of uh, throw uh, darts of blame uh, for every um, government and, and its inability. Now, it seems to me the wonderful thing about what you're doing is you've changed the, changed the whole landscape here by saying, let's, let's not use that way of thinking about governance. Let's innovate. Let's, let's work in some other ways. And you've done it from the ground up. Uh, which is all all the better. I mean, if I, I and I I admire this so much, and we we like to call it relational because it seems to me the kinds of things you're doing for one pivot on the relational process. It's that process what you might call design, Hillary, which which is absolutely essential. And it seems to me it it is also inclusive. It invites us to be participatory in what we're doing. And um, I am just full of admiration. And Monica, why don't you open this? So uh, this would be, what would you um, like? To... Yeah. Thank you, Kent. Uh, I think like you, Kent, I feel great admiration for Hillary and Ota. And uh, I admire what Hillary has been doing in terms of relational welfare. I think it has inspired my work, Otar's work, and also admire how Otar has been evolving towards social justice and how social justice practices look in practice, not only theoretically or academically and uh, circles. So I have a question for you and um, Hilary and Otara, and I don't know who would like to start, but we first would like that the people who do not know you get to know you better. So would you mind sharing what are you doing? What is your work about? And uh, what are your current projects? So people get to know you more, better? Shall I start? Yes, go ahead, Hilary. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that I'm very honoured to be here. Um, it's really lovely to be with Monica and Ken and Otto. I mean, I admire your work so much, but also I've been watching all the participants come into the room and it's it's just very inspiring to see where you're from, all the places that you're from. It's really an honour to, I'm really happy to have this time to spend with you. Um, my current work is actually on the future of work. Um, I'm very interested how technology revolutions in particular create a space for us to reimagine work and work organizing. And I'm currently working in five post-industrial locations, thinking with a very relational lens, how we could redesign work in practice in this century. But um, it's afternoon for me this afternoon. Um, I thought just because of where the, the conversation is coming from that I would focus on a, a different piece of work which was a 10 year experiment I conducted to think about how we could design, redesign the welfare state, which is the subject of my book, Radical Help, which was very kindly mentioned. Um, so Ken was just talking about how government institutions are out of step, out of kilter with our social, our economic, our ecological, our emotional realities. And I think this is particularly the case for welfare systems, for state social systems, which were designed in the last century in a very industrial era for certain types of problems and certain types of family structures and economies that are no longer with us. So Radical Help is a 10 year inquiry in communities in Britain to say, if we started again now, how would we redesign support that could enable us all to flourish. 
And I think that last bit's really important because the 20th century designs were about managing need. They were about classifying and identifying what your need was, what you lacked, and then giving you something like a sticking plaster, like a band-aid to repair that lack. And the work I'm doing with communities is saying, how can we flourish? How can we build capabilities for all of us at every single stage of our lives? So when the British welfare state was designed, it went cradle to grave. So from the moment you're born to the moment you die. And through five experiments, I've been working with thousands of people to redesign interventions. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're services, sometimes they're not, they're community collaborations. I think we shouldn't always think that what we need is a service, but thinking about how we can have a capability approach to social systems today. So one of the rules of the work that I do is to think about how can we design social systems that are stronger the more people who use them. If we think about relationships and love, like the more people we love, the more love we have. It's not like something we have to ration. So, I mean, there's so many aspects of the relationships that I could talk about in this work, but one of them is this, like how do we design systems that don't need to be rationed, that are much stronger the more people who use them? And I can talk in a minute about some practical examples. But because I've taken the relationship lens to the work I've been, uh, the, ca the capability lens to the work I've been doing, in practice with communities, we've been exploring how we build the capacity to learn, to connect as communities, to have health and vitality, but also relationships. I just want to say that um, what we've learned in the work is that you can take out, I don't know how many people know the game of Jenga, where you take out these wooden blocks until everything falls down. You can take out every piece of our social systems and we can more or less stand up. But if you take out the relationship piece, if you stop thinking about how we connect to one another, and I mean that not just as how professionals connect to communities, but how we connect, how, our, how the systems themselves are relating to us and to each other, then the whole thing falls apart. So essentially I've been designing family support, support for older people, new health services, new services around work that take this idea that relationships between us are the most important thing and from there evolving. And I can come back to, to talk about how that looks in practice, but I think it's high time that Otter says about his work, which I very much admire. Thank you, Hilary. And I also must say thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, intriguing conversation. And uh, I must say, I'm not sure why I was invited because I'm here sitting to by being inspired for many years from the Taos Institute and Hilary's work on relational welfare. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we do. And we are taking well, it started out from my point, my sake was that I was working within recovery movement on, on uh, uh, people with severe mental health issues. And I was struck by why don't, why don't we, I don't think we need more research on that, re, that relationships are the most important factor for social change. But because there, we, have, we know that we have known that for many hundreds of years, but I was struck by why we don't lead and organize systems based on putting the relationships first. So, and uh, I was, um, I think this must be nine or 10 years ago, I can't remember, but it was in Denmark for a summer institute with the Taos Institute and me and Jacob Stork, uh, who you might know, we had this, uh, we, we hooked up just to talk about uh, how organizations and leadership could, could, um, strengths and, and be more of support of people uh, with living in the most kind of left behind uh, lives. And then there was this guy who, who lifted an article in the audience, and that was your article, Hillary, called Relational Welfare. And that was the beginning of changing from family therapy, from, from my point of view, and into the relational governance aspects. So I must say thank you first to Taos and Hillary and all the people from the Taos during all the years that I have inspired my work on, on um, social justice, as we say. Just to, if I can continue, if, let me know if this goes too fast. But um, 
what we are most into at the moment is uh, I like what you say, Ken, about the local and the and the global. So we call it a global uh, approach on on the agenda. And we are I'm, I'm living in Norway, which is a very good welfare state, and uh, and uh, we are known as the best welfare state in the world. But even though uh, we have this uh, good safety net for people when they are in need of different kinds, we still are facing. Uh, we are struggling, and uh, as you also may have known from the COVID situation, is that the social inequalities is very um, on a rise, and the crisis on energy and food and climate is really affecting people's lives. and And uh, it's quite interesting to see now that people who are so called resourceful are now uh, going to the food to get food or they don't are living more in poverty so i'm i'm interested in then how how the work on on who has been working on the well-being economy so so i'm i'm going to talk about, more about that in a in a minute but we we just went to iceland and we have in finland and scotland and wales and you also have new zealand who is trying to challenge this idea of only measuring people or the welfare states or the country's growth on based on economy, so the GDP. So they are looking into how to also uh, address uh, economic uh, well-being and also environmental aspects of supplementing or, or going beyond the GDP. So uh, and they are they are really happening a lot of interesting stuff both on the government point of view for example in in Iceland it's the prime minister who are in front or in charge of this movement and and also in Scotland I think and in and in Wales and um, and uh, it's also affecting what people do on their micro levels on the relationships in neighborhoods and so forth so I can speak more on, on examples of that later on but it's it's quite interesting to see how what happens if you put well-being and uh, social justice as the mission of change and and uh, and uh, then what changes then the the role of institutions and politicians and practitioners and so forth but i'm still struck on why it's so hard for some uh, context to to believe that relationships can be uh, the 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 starting point, the aim, and the way of thinking when you're trying to to work with social change, if that makes any change, it's still that we are working on systems for systems' sake, and uh, and very system oriented, and uh, less uh, social just or relational oriented. Yeah, if if if, if I can stop there for now. Yeah. I really think we need to put some meat on those bones. Most of us work in local situations. And Hillary, can you give us a good, good, colorful example of an actual design of a practice that has worked for you? That you feel? So um, I would like to answer your question, Ken, with two examples, if I can, which means I can't go very deep, but just to give you a sense. So um, one, one example would be uh, the families that we work with. So very similar to how, you know, Otto is explaining, um, you know, in, well, I mean, I, I, some, similar in some ways, we have a lot of poverty in Britain. You know, we have really growing inequalities in Britain. Um, in fact, the uh, foundation that I'm a trustee of that has collected poverty data for the last 200 years just re in, just invented a new category after 200 years to capture the extreme poverty we now see in the UK. Incredible. But um, I've been working with families who are marginalized economically <laughs> and with local government. And uh, one particular locality, first of all, asked me, they said, Again, to Otter's point, we've reorganized our systems. We've had so much innovation, but still the same families are not thriving in our communities. Can you come and help us? And I said, I don't know, I, I don't know. But could you introduce me to a family? Well, in fact, first of all, I said, could you introduce me to a family that has successfully transitioned out of your system and been helped by you? And they said, no. 
So I said, could you introduce me to a family then that needs help? And so uh, I'm uh, with a uh, small team, we met a family. And in fact, we moved to the neighborhood where a number of these families were living. And our role was just to observe, to be there, to create relationships of trust by just being there after dark, talking, listening, observing their days. And so uh, what we observed was that these families have an average of about 137 state employees in their life. So these are people who come because the children are not attending school, health workers, people who are trying to take them to court because they haven't paid their rent, like a whole lot of people. And the state said at the time that these families cost us half a million pounds, about half, well, you know, our currency has collapsed. So half a million dollars just to, to service these families every year. And we said, no, you're not spending a penny on these families. You're spending <laughs> half a million dollars on a system that is spinning around these families and holding them exactly where they are. So what we did was we asked everybody, it's a long story, but we asked all the state workers to stand back. And then we asked the families to interview for a team. And so the families held this interview process. I've given a TED talk and you can hear the process of how the families chose the workers. But really the families were looking for workers, social workers, health workers, who didn't talk according to some script as if they were from some institution. They talked humanly and they were honest. When the mother said, how would you help me with this? They said, I don't know. I'd have to stand by you and I would have to see what would happen. And so the mother said, okay, great. So what happened in this story is that what's really important I think is it was exactly the same workers that were there before. But because now what we said to the workers was your role is just to be by the families. The families are going to lead the change. The families are going to decide what is going to help them change their lives because you've been there for a long time giving advice and nothing has changed. And your role will be to support the families when they decide what to do. So usually the families started with quite small things. Uh, they wanted to, their houses were you know, in a, in a state of disrepair. They felt unsafe in the houses. They wanted help to make their houses feel safe. So whatever it was that built the first step of confidence the team helped the family do that and then said, what's the next thing you need? And so on. And gradually a process unfolded that the children went back to school, that the parents found the confidence to, to, to go to work and the families began to, to, to change their lives and to grow their capabilities. And we've taken this work now to four places in the UK. But there are only really two rules to this programme. One is that the families will lead so there's no program in that sense. The families will decide what's needed and you will have a relationship of trust to support the family to make that change. And the second thing was, uh, technology is important to this, that we had a piece of technology that took away the time that the workers were spending on bureaucracy. Because what we saw was that 80% of the state workers' time was spent on filling out forms. <laughs> and only 20%, in fact, it was less, but about, <laughs> be nice, 20%, of the time was spent to work with families. So we made an inversion and we said now 80% is to work with families. So some of the relational work I've been doing is like this. It's inside what I call the belly of the beast in the state system, supporting workers who are in that system, who are fantastic professionals and want to make change in people's lives, want to be relational, but are not allowed to be by the kind of rules of the system. So it's taking away the rules of the system. But some of the work I've done is not in the state, it's just in the community. Um, an example of this work would be work we've done with older people in um, communities in Britain to build something we call Circle, which is a system of support where older people uh, join and get um, on-demand practical support. So if you need somebody to pick you up when you're leaving hospital, but also we have a very rich social calendar and really it's about reconnecting, re-knitting people together and supporting them um, from sort of 50, 60 onwards to kind of 90, 97 years old, however long, um, to kind of lead rich, fulfilling lives. And what we've seen is that we have helpers and we have members, but really it's, it's, it's 
I say that the person who runs a circle is like a good party host. They know how to kind of bring you there, how to make you feel comfortable in any setting and how to make these micro, micro connections, which enable you to live in your house as long as possible, to have a rich social life, to feel whatever age you are, that you're still flourishing and thriving and, and an important part of your community. So, I mean, it's hard in the time we have to give really kind of concrete examples, but I hope Ken, yeah, that, that makes it seem, yeah. I mean, a, a circle is for about 10,000 people, just to give you an example. So obviously the family work is quite small because we're working with a small number of families that are in extremely difficult circumstances, but the, the relational work with, with older people is, is much with many, many more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Otar. Need to concretize some of what you've said because what would be so, a good example, of, for example, of relational welfare, of the kinds of things that you're advocating or supporting, or have been involved in? Well, it's it's quite similar. It's interesting to listen to Hillary and also what you have been doing. All of what I have, when I have been listening to you, it's you have a similar project in in uh, in norway which is called the citizens uh, project which is the Trond municipality of trondheim who are uh, and and also the government of norway tries there are different kind of reforms coming which is quite interesting and one of the reform in norway is called a trust reform which is which is how to rebuild trust within the governance systems and uh, Sweden has done, and Denmark has done it, but Norway is just coming. And it's interesting to that it is um, coming a reform of trust in um, in a democracy that actually has a lot of trust. So it's <laughs> that's a that's another story. But what um, what happened is that for for uh, there's a special a special group in Norway who are. Uh, if I can take a little bit um, discussion back, because you, this is the um, UN Sustainability Goals, you who are maybe familiar with, they are the 17 goals. And we have been most interested in, in the dream that the UN had when they dreamed up a society, a well-being society, and that was leaving no one behind. And, and Norway has has two special groups who are most left behind, and that is uh, families with the low income, and young people who are socially excluded. So the government uh, said that, okay, if we're going to build some trust down in the local communities, there are 250 uh, kind of special projects you can apply money for, but no one knows where to find the money. It's hard to reach them. It's very bureaucratic. So they, they collected all the five of these uh, budgets and gave uh, 12 uh, municipalities uh, the opportunity to say, okay, if you this is how much money you get if you would apply for these five budgets and or accounts. And then Trondheim municipality said, okay, let's experiment with uh, together with the with the citizens on what 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 are these money going to be spent on. So so instead of and and they said that there is it, this money is not allowed to be spent on routines or new positions. They are only going to be for citizens. So what happened was that uh, professionals started to uh, get to know uh, the families and uh, young people who were in socially excluded uh, positions and ask what would you, uh, what would you um, need or want to do in your life to feel that you are an actual real participant in in your society. And it was also a little bit based on, I think you know him, Cormac Russell, Hillary, who wrote this article, Does Medicine Makes Us Sicker? And in that article, it's a quote saying, the, the, the twin sister to loneliness is uselessness, which is, so how, what kind of message do the government say give the citizens? So what happened was that the citizens really understood that Oh, it's used for me. I'm I'm a participant of value in this uh, municipality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, just to concretize, the, they are now having eight pilot studies. So, young people said that if I'm going to be part of the society, I need uh, the the possibility for 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 a driver's license. 
And they also wanted to have a better relationship with the poli police. So, uh, so what happened was that they created a project together, or, or where, uh, to, which is called Towards Drivers License. It was very important that the government is not paying and giving their driver's license. It's the process of of getting the driver's license, and then it was the police officers who train driving with the um, with the young uh, the adolescents, and also that it was a private company who gave the cars and everything. So what is interesting is when what when um, these young people really kind of uh, felt that it's use for me, I'm of value, you take me seriously, uh, then uh, they again started to be boundary spanners within other communities in, in the municipality towards other young people who were socially excluded. And, and so they are now tr training, they want to be trained peer supporters, so forth. And also the police now for, for the last year have reported there has been no reports on, on criminal activities, which was originally based on this, uh, this group. There, there have been no uh, reports on crim criminal ac accidents in this group the last year, which is quite interesting what happens. When, when you kind of start with a relationship. And also the police says that uh, by working together towards this driver's license, that that is the third thing that they are coordinating around, they get a better relationship with the police. So 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 I think that's just one example of, uh, of, uh, of how we are working at the moment. That is just one pilot within the municipality among others. Other pilots are about refugees, uh, families who are very, very poor. Uh, also, one pilot is about anchor institutions. What happens if you rethink uh, anchor institutions such as schools or kindergartens as not only a, a service, but a meeting place in the co local community and the services can be coordinated coordinated mm -hmm. around yeah, yeah. The, the schools and so forth. So, it's so it's so fascinating what happens when. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, fantastic. So, Otar and uh, Hilary, there are some questions in the chat that I will be bringing to you. But first, I have one for you both. And I live in in Canada, and part of my research intersects also with immigrants and refugees. And uh, I see, for example, that there are. 2 million of uh, temporary farm workers that are without a status, right? And we bring them and in Canada, they work to, to, to produce the food and many of the things and uh, we eat, right? And they have no access to medical services, mental health services, and other other things that people with residency, other rights with people of residency might have benefits. And they are still without a status, right? Like two million. And I always wonder, and uh, how is that like, and in terms of uh, relational governance, it is about uh, changing the policies, it's about changing the laws, it's about changing leadership. It's about the way we we talk or we care about people. So, and like in, in moving forward, these issues, where, where do you see and uh, hope in moving forward? And uh, it is in terms of transforming leadership, it's in terms of transforming policy. And Ginny and has some questions also in, in, in the chat about like if it's about incorporating governance and of the corporate sector as part of the system. And you, you might have access to her questions. Are there cross-sector solutions? So where do you see hope and, and where do you see that we can move forward? Do you want me to, to speak? Um, so these are really big questions. They're really fantastic questions. They're really big questions. I mean, if I can start on the, the question of immigration, you know, we are living at the beginning of an extraordinary climate crisis. And so any questions we have now about immigration are going to be completely dwarfed by the need 
for people to move from places in the globe that that are already suffering. I mean, we're COP at the moment is in in Egypt, but you know, fifty thousand kilometers further south in Somalia, pretty much every single herds person has lost their livelihood for good and is living in a in a camp city outside the kind of main cities in Somalia. So, so this is a this is this is something really enormous. One thing that I think is small but very important in this is that the the most hope we can see is where, in fact, there aren't kind of um, incumbent inherited systems, but actually citizens are able to invent things for themselves. So we've got a movement in Britain. It's quite small. We've obviously got a government that is trying to fly immigrants to Rwanda and get as many people out as possible. So we've got a kind of state response, which is extremely punitive with all kinds of sort of weaponizing all kinds of language to make people feel very frightened. But incredibly on the ground in communities, we've got something else, which is like where I live, we meet in the mosque or the church and we talk about how the community can support each family. And then that has really escalated with uh, Homes for Ukraine of opening homes. We haven't done it in Britain because we're kind of, you have to cross the water in the same way that let's say has happened in neighboring countries in Poland or whatever. But I think we've got this really incredible relational experiment, which is saying that the way that, that we're going to manage this ourselves, we're not part of this rhetoric and we're going to find ways to support people to knit incomers into our communities in a completely different way. And I think this is really important for policy, because I think one, I think that, that obviously what I'm talking about now is quite small scale, but it's very concrete and it's, you know, 50,000 Ukrainian families or whatever. And we're saying to the government, you know, th this is the way to do it. We can give you the practice that actually as people, we want to think about this as a human to human, as a horizontal relationship. And we're showing you how this can be done. And I think that, I mean, I could say so much, but I think that leads to the question that you asked me about cross sector. So, you know, and, and again, I think Os Os Otter said something so important about this, about this focus on system change and constantly changing the rules and the systems. I don't know how many cycles in the UK we've been through of kind of system reorganisation, you know, the, the health service, the this or that. We're, we're never able to integrate or work cross sector. But if instead we understand this from a human level and we think human out, not system out, but we think about humans and we think about our connections with one another, then obviously we do then, then, then there isn't even a question about cross sector because all of those things, they're not like sectors in my life, your education, health, everything else. It all, it all knits together in my life. And if we stand, you know, as we did with the families in the homes, in other people's shoes, then then we begin to ask very different questions and those questions are extremely human and they begin to show us the next stage that we could do. The last thing I'll say about this is that in COVID in the UK, we had a very good lesson in this where people took off their badge from wherever they were from and in an emergency, they met the person in front of them and they said, how can I help? What do you need now? Who can I connect you to? And it was profound work. So. Unfortunately, this is all quite small, but I think we're seeing really important interventions that show on a very relational way, in an everyday relational way, how things can work and how we can work from that out. Thank you, Hilary. And it's okay if I ask you the same question, Sotar? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just, um, it's going to be, a, it's really interesting to hear what you say and reflect, Hilary. It's, uh, I think also it's what brings me hope is the is human beings on the micro level in the in the local neighborhoods who are very creative in in supporting and helping people in that are in coming from different uh, kind of parts of the world and also uh, I think it's uh, it's um, it it seems that. Uh, I was just inspired by, there are two Danish researchers called uh, Jacob Torfing and Eva Sørensen, who we had on the Relational Governance Symposium, who have been looking at uh, robust robust governance in turbulent times. And all of these good, I think, good projects that are coming. And what gives me hope is that in a time of crisis, uh, something, but we, something good happens. 
but the problem is that that dif- the the crises are very different also on different countries so the financial crisis the covid crisis the immigration crisis the climate crisis that we are really facing it's quite warm here in norway at the moment for example is is a a, a loop for 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 engagement so i think what i also see as as hope is that uh, that uh, that there are uh, engagement from the neighborhoods and local people who are organized but also i think i'm not so familiar what happens in other uh, states than uh, but it's it's a very polarized europe for example at the moment with the war and brexit and and everything and it, i think it's um i think there are um well what concerns me though if i can say that as well <laughs> is uh, is that uh, how how can how can we be kind to each other in this uh, in this process uh, where we are facing very harsh um, responses on 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 our on our communities? I think I feel I feel also that there are very there's very nice and kindness, but there's also very harshness on how we how we relate to each other. So so how can I'm not, I'm I'm very much searching for how. What kind of dialogues emerge to decrease the polarization? But because it seems like the polarization is increasing between different groups, uh, social inequalities, races, and so forth in Europe, which which has been not a discussion for many years. Uh, uh, Otar, you must come back on Wednesday. We're working with a group called Braver Angels. Oh. Attempts to break down the polarization and nationwide and in communities. <clears throat> but I want to come back to um, the issue of, uh, of systems demands. That is, what the kinds of work that you described is on the local level, working with local governments or, or the people from government who work at those levels, and you've managed to break down that the, the relation, break down the, the, the barrier between governance and people in really interesting ways, and they're tied to human needs at the time, listening and trying to accommodate. Now, that's messy because everybody's needs are changing and so on. You realize that. Governments require all these forms filled out because well, they're trying to organize all this and, and make it standard because that way you, everybody's got treated fairly and they can give accountability. Is it working? And they can make sure nobody's misspending the money and so on and so on. They have their requirements from the top down. At some point, the local is going to meet the, the system. How can you change ground up so that the system becomes less systematic and more attuned to those local needs. At some point, you're going to run into that. How do you handle it? Have you, are you hopeful? Have you seen changes where you've actually been able to move government at an upper level? I'm just curious about how, what is that issue to you and how have you seen it work out? Hillary, do you have an answer to that? Well, I don't have an answer, but I have some thoughts. (laughs) Um, You know, Britain is the most centralised country in Europe. And so, you know, I work at at the local state level and with, you know, with, with local leaders, state leaders who are doing incredible things, but the pressure is exerted from the centre on them continually. Um, I think I think we do have a crisis because I think we are what we can see from history is that we need a we need a, a reimagining of institutional structures that we don't live in a kind of you know as, as you pointed out before Ken you know we don't live in an era where the big big problems can be tackled by nation states we need different kind of levels of relationship and collaboration um, we don't we don't live in an era of industrial production, and we have governments 
that basically still think that they can change things through, you know, they talk about levers, pulling levers, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very industrial mechanistic mindset. And another thing about that mindset is that it's a sort of Pareto optimal mindset. And what I mean by that is it's a very, that it's a, it's, it's, um, and this I think is very important to the work of the Taos Institute. I mean, what I mean is that the work you do is a very important intervention here because in actually quite a comparatively short historical period, economics has taken over as a discipline. And so what we have are, you know, state leaders that see, that have a, that above all think of equilibrium and how things can be returned to equilibrium. Can we manage an uptick in inflation? Can we manage that moment when somebody falls out of work? How can we find that kind of, that, that, that balance? That's one thing. And the other thing is that that mindset is also all about risk. How can we manage risk? And we put an enormous amount of our resource into managing risk. And the reality of the modern world, and a lot of this is to do with kind of, you know, digital cultures, again, something, Ken, that you've done so much work on, we don't live in a world where risk can be managed and there is no such thing as this kind of stable optimality. In fact, life is change. And this can be a really good thing. When we go on holiday, we're really happy to have change, but it's not a good thing unless we have the institutions and structures around us that help us imagine that. So this is a kind of very long way of saying that, that I really agree with your question. And I think that the reason we're stuck is because we, in order for things to kind of shift into the next era, we really need a very different thinking about what institutions and government are. And yet the only people that can introduce that are the same kind of state actors that have become completely imprisoned in these transactional, it's very vertical, everything about relationships is horizontal. We're the new horizontalists. And these people are completely vertical. Information yep. must pass up and down, command and control. Yep. So I think that that the I think that basically pressure has to come from different sources, and there've been some really really interesting questions in the chat about this. I mean, originally I studied history, and I when I look historically at these moments, I think what we need are civil society, and we can be really excited by things like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, you know, Just Stop Oil, Extinction Rebellion. That we are going to need this kind of public pressure exerted in different ways. Um, we're going to need, uh, or you know, we're going to need business as well to rethink. And generally, when we've seen change, we have seen a shift in the mindset of of business and kind of finance. And we're not seeing that yet. You know, we're seeing the kind of new technologists try to escape to Mars or whatever. We're seeing conversation about different forms of social and governments, but we're not seeing the change yet. And we've got to see that change. Oh. Yeah, so I'll just say that the other two groups and then I'll pause. So we also need different ideas coming from different disciplines, which is why I think this conversation and the work of the Taos Institute is so important. We can see regenerative economics and new ideas in economics, but the big ideas are coming from physics, biology, psychology, this is what we need. And then we need to get behind those people in the state who do see differently because there are people People, but they're quite isolated and part of our work I think is to make relationships with those people who are state actors and are almost seen as mad people at the moment in in those institutions but are the future and how can we support them how can we relate to them and get behind them I think is also mm -hmm. part of the question. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I don't miss in previous questions but there is I will start with Greg Spiro, Spiro. And Greg is asking, do you think we can make enough progress with relational citizen-oriented communities without reform of our electoral systems? How do we uh, persuade our self-serving politicians give up their power centers? And also Papusa asked later if, uh, Hilary, do you have any experience with Global South, Latin America, Africa, and Asia? For Otar or, or Hilary? Well, that's that's really a big question. So I was I was just uh, contemplating a little bit about what you said earlier before I respond to it. It's uh, it's also interesting to see because there was some um, research in Denmark lately who showed that uh, seventy percent of the barriers within the governance systems are made by by the local governments by themselves and not by the national governments. So so there's. So, so, so there's, I think I really agree what you say, Hillary, and also I agree on how the bottom up has to challenge uh, what we call the bureaucracy. So I think um, there, there is actually a lot of 
uh, opportunity spaces already, but we don't see it because we are not trained into into not seeing it. And then about the electoral systems, I, I'm I think that is a very interesting question, but also linked to trust again. So I think uh, it depends. It's a very big question on re the representative democracy and the liberative democracy and how. Because um, if you're using the language of common good, for example, and public value and so forth, and everyone can put their discourse in that uh, in that sense that everything is common good, even though, even though uh, you have quite uh, inequitable <laughs> agendas, but it's for the common good as their point of view. So I think I think it's interesting to see how how can we because I'm I'm wondering. Who has the response? How how who has the responsibility at the end of uh, of um, change of the social change? Because I think uh, sometimes it seems like we are. Um, what what is the what is the role then of public sector in different countries? And I'm just sorry to say I'm most familiar with the Nordic uh, context where where we have a very good uh, public sector, but it seems like that we are trying to co-create res the responsibility but we are and then we are trying to co-create solutions and that is uh, change that is challenging what we actually do so so the so politicians uh, responsibilities is are changing their role is changing they don't want to participate with the democracy with, with the citizens for example and and uh, so forth so i think it's it depends on, and it's and and the electoral systems are so different, and we see a lack, a decrease of participation by young people in in voting, for example. And I think some of the young people that we have been interviewing on that issue is that they see they don't see themselves as part of the solution, so they have given up, in one sense, that the, that the politicians. Can be of, 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 of can be of charge of the social change. So there, there is this. I think there has to be a a bottom up social change movement and and um, collaborating in different aspects of um, of social change. If that makes sense. Um, Lothar, you spoke earlier about well being economy and your involvement in that that movement, right? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Um, do you think there is any movement there in terms of a top-down, because that is a top-down orientation, in trying to meet that the needs of the bottom? That is, that there's a there's a place where indeed it may go horizontal, where yeah. the, the the needs of the people can speak to the needs of the economy, which is trying to do. Do something for the well-being of all instead of uh, for the corporate sector. I mean, is that that an optimistic view? Well, I think it's it is an optimistic view, and I think it's an optimistic uh, paradigm as well. Because what is what they are challenging is that there are top leaders in the in the in the world who would like to address that moving from um, profit into people. And uh, and then how to and they want to co how to how to work with the the private sector in spending also on the corporate social responsibility act and how to work with banks for example also in in, in how banks can be a, a facilitator and uh, and um uh, and also a, a driver for for social change together with the citizens I I, I have hope in in the well being economy or the economy so well-being in that sense but it it depends on if it's no if it's still uh if it's still if if it's still part of the gdp i think we're going to be stuck because then we are going into profit and not to not to social change uh, here's another case we david cooperider was with us two days ago and talking about enormous movement and he's involved with we're trying to get the corporate sector into the well-being of uh, into the common good and uh, bringing you know two thousand people together from heads of companies involved with that kind of thing. So there mm -hmm. is that. And that recording, I guess, will be on the Tal site. Can I can I say something? Because um, uh, Monica, you, you asked about um, the question: 
does this apply to the global south or I can't remember exactly what, what the question was but I just wanted to come back to that because I, I see in the chat that so many participants are from Latin America in particular um, so I just wanted to say uh, on a very personal level is that um, everything I learned I learned in Latin America so my story is that you know I, I left university and I was idealistic and I wanted to work in what was then called I'm quite old in what was then called third world development and uh, I went to work for a guerrilla army and then I went to work for a very large famous not-for-profit which you'll all have heard of and then I went then I ended up at the World Bank and I had responsibility for po poverty in southern Africa in urban southern Africa in six countries and what I learned was what uh, Ken has written about in his relational governance uh, paper, which was that, you know, that about insider realities, you know, and about the kind of logics of all of these organizations, whether it was the guerrilla army, the not for profit or the World Bank, that, that made it completely impossible for those organizations to actually make any kind of meaningful or sustainable social mm, change. Yeah. All my colleagues from whom I learned a lot were fantastic people. Like they were really, they're not, they were not cynical. They were good people, well-meaning people, but working within institutional logics that couldn't make sense, couldn't make change. And so what I did was I basically, I mean, almost 30 years ago today, I left my very nice apartment in Washington, DC. And I moved to the kind of biggest, most infamous barrio in the Dominican Republic in San Domingo. And I went there to live and I lived in this barrio and I had, no agenda. I just wanted to kind of unlearn everything I knew and think in a completely different way that if this was my everyday lived reality, how would I now construct my work to use resources to kind of make the kind of change we need to make? And that was the beginning of, of really a kind of fundamental methodological switch in the way that I work. And I think this is really important because, you know, I don't think we, we can't do relational work, we can't make the change either locally or systemically in the way we're talking about if we use the same methods and if we work in the same way that those institutions work. And you know what I think we see a lot of now, especially in the UK, relational welfare, it's become very fashionable. And what it means is that we'll go to communities and we'll ask some kind of relational questions and then we'll go back to our institutions and we'll reinvent something and we'll still roll it to you in that kind of transactional vertical industrial way that we've been talking about. And, and I think that in Latin America, I don't want to minimize, you know, the, the challenges. I mean, you know, like I, I have a lot of Latin friends. I kind of like I'm, I would I would love to there to be a book called Ayuda Radical instead of Radical Help that we could have the translation. And because I tell stories in the book about about the Dominican Republic. But but the thing is, is that is that I think that there's a kind of history of a different kind of activism, also of a weakness of the state, which is not into which causes problems, but has got something in it that's very valuable. And I think there's a real possibility of working in these very different ways in Latin America, which often culturally, at least in Britain, is, is quite hard to do. So I think that that there's um that this is I mean it's a big I think I just wanted to say acknowledge that I think it's a really important question that I myself, my my university, if you like, was the barrio. Um, I've since worked in other Latin American countries. And I think the possibility of this starting, I mean, you know, one of the big problems is global inequality and the ecological crisis. And the ideas are not going to come from these kind of industrial countries in the North. Part of the rebalancing is going to be the energy that exists in other places and the solutions that exist in other places and how we have the humility to learn from that, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Hilary, for answering that question. There are many comments in the chat about uh, they really like this idea of the bottom up. Uh, they are also enjoying your examples. So maybe drawing a little bit of what people is commenting in the chat, I think, um, would you mind expanding, like what helped you, like the two of you are like good examples of relationality and uh, transforming systems from the bottom up and being impactful and meaningful in what you do. I love uh, your concept or talk about the lo local or something like that. And uh, so what has helped you 
to uh, create those generative processes and make impact and transformation? What, what has been working for you? What has helped you to, to do that? I can start. And um, well, uh, there's a there's a long history, of all from how my father worked with the <laughs> local communities uh, and been inspired by his dream of a school is a culture house where where the post um, postal house and the school and everything was together in a meeting place. But the last kind of, if I want to say a last example on on how this has helped is that. There was a pivotal shift in in Trondheim municipality a few years ago, when when all of them went to the relational welfare conference in Denmark and listened to Hillary, and they they changed the whole the whole strategy of growing up services in Trondheim from from individualistic perspectives into stronger communities for children, and and when the politicians accept that was the first time a strategy was unanimously. Uh, went through the the board of uh, of uh, politicians in in the council in in the municipality, and that has been a driving force for for all the experiments happening around us, which has made a very interesting experiment uh, place. So instead of saying, because what I think I I very much agree with what Hillary said that we have to shift from from also within the research that we have. Um, that, that we are doing experiments and then we are doing research and then we report on the research like a few years later. But we have to think about everything as experiments. And we have to think about that from the beginning and not from after. So I think that is maybe what has very, really very much inspired me at the moment is that we have a very good city council and a very brave city council and a great director of the city who has who is trying to 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 manage or leave create the uh, this the uh, spaces of opportunities for the citizens in in the uh, in, in living in Trondheim. i think that has been a very motivation for for all, us and also addressing the inequalities in the city and the list of of so called groups living in with inequalities is just growing in norway so so we have to we have to think differently and also from systems, we are not delivering services. We are, we are co-creating relationships and making micro connections all, all the time. And how can the municipality facilitate that? And I, I think, together with the artists, together with the um, musicians, together with the, the citizens, and 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 also it was when they were were trying to make the last strategy for for what which is going to be uh, through the city council this week the directors and the politicians have, have been visiting children so chil to try to try to give children a voice of, of of social change in the municipality so i think that has been very a big motivation for me looking at they are taking children and the citizens seriously which is oh. fantastic to see <laughs> You both have, are very good at co-creating and working with numbers of local people. I'm, I'm I'm curious about whether you feel there are larger networks within which you work. I mean, in terms of the global south, but also Asia and other places where there are other forms of experimentation that you feel linked to, that you could be optimistic about this and that movement or this or that experiment, and one could imagine some kind of global sensibility that is changing, that perhaps we should listen to the drumbeats around us and that we could unite those linkages in some way? I mean, is that is that too optimistic or do you feel that what you're doing is sort of special and and limited to your own countries and so on? How, how, how do you feel about your the, the potential network and its potential for global change? Um, can I just say something before that about bottom up, which I feel yep. is quite important just to, so I need to say that I'm, I'm quite ambivalent about bottom up. You know, we have this, at the moment, community is very fashionable again. It was last fashionable in the 70s. It's kind of rising up. It's like a kind of pump, 
you know, up comes community, down goes the state, and then it goes like this. And I think that this is why the relational lens in one very simple way is so important, because actually what we need is a different relationship between all these actors, not, I mean, not to say, oh, now it's the moment of this. Of course, I believe in, commu I'm a community activist. I do my work in the communities. I think it's really important. And I think what Otter just said about, well, I didn't know that about Trondheim. It's, you know, going to keep me going for months, but also the fact that, you know, talking to the children, this is, this is critical. But what is more important ultimately is that we reform relationships, that power shifts and all these groups come together in new connected ways rather than that this is just the moment of, of this group I think is really important. And for me, working visually is a very important equalizer. So when I do my work, like in the creation of the family programs or in the creation of the, of the elder people's programs, I put government actors into the team and they have to work according to my methods without any hierarchy, which is which takes them time. And I really admire the people who join me. But it's really critical because it means that when we've made the work, we're not turning up then at the government office saying, oh, look, we've got a good idea. Would you like to fund this now? They actually made the work with us. They own the work. It's it's genuinely co-created. And then the next phase of how we actually think about that being funded and accessed by everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think that's mm -hmm. really, really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, Ken, you're, I mean, I, I was in Detroit a few weeks ago. I mean, like what is happening in Detroit in terms of kind of the food movement and, you know, like, Every, like I think there's different pockets of this everywhere and I think because you know a bit like what Otter just said about Tron time all of us there's 60 of us here and most days probably we feel like we're rolling this really heavy rock up the hill and then every now and again it's like oh we're connected yeah. like it's working yeah. so I think that that it's very important to me to have these connections but I I think of the idea like a design code which is that the connections kind of make me think about the code um, and the code is universal. It's not a blueprint. It's like it is a code. But how we think of the application in that of the code in that place is really different depending on the culture of that place, the history of that place. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it does really matter that I'm working in actual communities with that actual reality. It doesn't mean to say that I'm not connected, but if I'm working, you know, on the, at the moment I'm working on work, I'm working in places where there isn't any good work. Like, I my work is about thinking how we make sure there is that good work it's very very concrete and that is and that is something that has to happen in place and that's very important to me okay good. otar <laughs> connectivity yeah i think i think what do you have been doing with the taos institute has been a very for me uh the, the network or uh, since 2006 7 because it's it's uh, for me run uh, driving around in Norway is such a small country and there's actually I think I'm quite optimistic in some ways because there's a lot of of uh, uh, practitioners or communities who are doing so many fantastic uh, things and also what what is really good for me is to know that the people from the Taos community is is not that far away. So we can be in contact in Brazil and Spain and Czech Republic and 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 I know that all of these practitioners are doing already uh, good and inspiring work. So for me, connectivity is also um, uh, being part of of that community or this community. I think there is a question in the chat. I'm also intrigued and uh, because many of us, we want to also be meaningful in our communities and many of us have in different ways, leadership. And But uh, Otar, you mentioned uh, that you have connection with municipality and the local authorities have support and been inspired and work with you. And Hilary, I think you also have been invited and you have been participated with a government. Uh, so how do you both create it or create those connections? What, what has helped you to be relational and influential at the same time with these people in leadership positions and government? Well, great question. Um, how to say it's, it's on different... Um, 
aspects. I, uh, there's a government on the local government. They have there there we have good connections because we have a leadership in in many communities in Norway who who are very they need they see they they really see their need for change and they are searching for for knowledge and practices. But they're still what is problematic is that they are still put in position to defend their budgets. So they are a bit. Uh, kind of scared of doing that but they are I, I feel that they are in very much want to participate but they don't but they are in search for solutions and they are and it's it's and it's problematic for them to to dare so it depends on who the leaderships uh, want to participate and then there are some brave uh, uh, directors in different municipalities and governments who 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 would like to do it but also there are I see that there are a lot of bureaucrats if, if you can use that in a very positive word because there there are many ground uh, gra grassroots bureaucrats in the in ministries actually in in some of the in the nordic countries who are promoting this way of change so they are also in 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 a connection with us and also how they they are it's important for me to work with them into providing a space for the the um, uh, the big bosses to to participate and and I feel that they want to but they are they haven't found the solution how to create a system that they or create challenge the system that that uh, helps them move beyond defending their budgets but uh, yeah. I feel that they are are want to to um, participate but it, they what they see mostly is when they meet citizens and they are in put in positions with citizens and they want to listen. Don, does your presence mean we're supposed to close? Yes. <laughs> I hate to bring this to a close. It's just such a wonderful um, conversation and, and inspiring. Um, anybody want to do one last 30 second before I take over? I just want to say, um, which is not a plug for my book, but I think this is such a critical part. And the third part of my book is exactly like very concretely how to do this with government. Because, great, great. Because, because if you don't do it, the, they will stop the work. I mean, either you're working all together as a team and it's progressing or else, as I'm sure Otto can really kind of tell a lot of stories about, the work stops. So I think that this is an incredibly fertile, rich thing to explore. So I just want to say that, I, I mean, I not to sell the book, but it, I have put a lot of, a third of the book is about this because I think it's so critical. So again, a huge thank you to Hillary and Otar for being our guests today. Thanks. Really, just oh, really, really fantastic. Thank so you. grateful. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Hilary and Otar. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody for your great questions. <laughs>